it's Jen, Jess, and Anna, and welcome to a video by the Creative Collective. So, for the people who are watching this for the first time, you might be thinking, why is this girl having a conversation with herself? Well, surprise, I actually am not having a conversation with myself because I struggle with dissociative identity disorder. DID was formerly known as multiple personality disorder, and what that means is that our consciousness is divided up into parts rather than being like one singular thing. Um, so Anna, Jess, and I are all parts in a larger collection of parts that make up this body's consciousness. Um, think of it as a bit like mosaic artwork. So each piece has its own shape and color and texture, um, but when viewed together with other pieces, it makes up a larger picture, and that is the whole person. So each part or altar, um, we each have our own memories, and likes and dislikes and opinions and beliefs and between us there's like this amnesiac wall um so i can't remember what jess does when she's out in the body and she can't remember what i do and like yeah yep get anna <laughs> right <laughs> so how and why does did develop uh and before i say this i'm going to note that all research articles used in this video are linked in the description below. Um, well, so when we're born, we are all born with separate parts of consciousness, like mosaic artwork. And you can see this in newborn babies. So they're either content or they're sleeping or they're crying because they're hungry or they have a soiled diaper. And that's why babies can go from content to crying very quickly, like this, because they're actually switching between these states of consciousness. And if these children grow up in a stable and supportive emotional environment, over time the caregiver, the caregiver helps the child to form connections between these parts of the consciousness, just through normal development. And so eventually, around the ages of seven to nine, um, the links between these parts become solidified around one singular identity. However, what happens to the child who experiences severe trauma or abuse during these years? Um, if they have an emotionally supportive caregiver, it's likely that the child will turn to that caregiver for support. And in turn, this caregiver will help them to process what has happened and help them to assimilate that part of consciousness that had the traumatic experience with their sense of like, this happened to me. Uh, and these are usually the children who typically develop PTSD. If the child does not have a supportive caregiver, however, they're forced to deal with the trauma on their own. And this trauma might be too much for the child's brain to process and cope with. Uh, so rather than assimilating that part of the consciousness with the sense that, yeah, this happened to me, instead the brain separates off that part of consciousness and puts up a wall of amnesia around it so that the emotions and the memory of that traumatic experience can't interfere with the everyday life and functioning of the child. And so these are the kids who develop DID or OSDD which is otherwise specified dissociative disorder. So instead of growing up with one singular identity, um, these children grow up with multiple identities. So that's why we are the way we are. Um, our parents are good parents, but for whatever reason, we never developed a secure emotional attachment to them. And then when some really severe abuse happened, um, we were forced to deal with it on our own. And our brain separated off those parts of consciousness and built a wall to hide those memories and emotions from Jen um, because she was like the functional one who had to go to school and keep the secret. Um, so now it's several of our littles and child alters who hold those memories and emotions, almost like they're frozen in time. Um, but it was the only way we were able to survive and still have a functional life. And because that's how our brain learned to deal with trauma and stress, you know, to 
walk off that part of consciousness rather than assimilate it with our sense of self, that's how our brain has dealt with trauma and stress ever since. Right, so I actually didn't split off when we were a small child. I split off when the body was 14. So you guys split off later. Did you realize you were part of a system uh, when it happened? And a system is what we collectively call all of the altars in this body. So did you guys realize you were part of a system when it happened? I didn't know that I was part of a system. Um, everything is really hazy at the beginning. Like I didn't have any memory of where I was. Almost like what people experience with their early childhood. Like you have no memories of it. You just kind of exist one day. Um, but people were calling me Jen, so I figured that's who I was. Um, a lot of things I innately knew how to do, like ballet and school and like cheerleading and stuff. I didn't really feel any association to your family. Um, there were just kind of people who were there and I knew I had to keep the fact that I couldn't remember my life before a secret. Um, it was just kind of a gut feel. And I think actually the people who I would consider as friends are very different from the people you considered as friends. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. Um, but for all of ninth grade and some of 10th grade, it was me. And I, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, so that makes total sense now because I have essentially no memories from ninth grade. Yeah, like I can't even name a single one. So what happened? I don't know. Um, I was around for a lot of trauma and situationally that kind of ended in 10th grade. So I guess what happened is that I went dormant. Um, it wasn't a choice. It was more like I went to sleep and just never woke up. And when I finally did, we lived in a different country and it was years later. Um, and I was really, really confused at first, and then angry, and I, I still feel like my life was stolen, and I'm trying to come to terms with it now by building a new life, but I have a lot of jealousy and resentment <laughs> towards you. I, I understand completely. I can't even imagine what it would feel like to just suddenly wake up in a different decade and have missed all of those years and experiences and just life. Yeah, I completely understand why you would feel resentment towards me. But anyway, what happened happened. Um, I didn't deal with it well for nearly a decade. I was technically what you would call a persecutor alter. Um, and I definitely got a bad case of Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> and I was really torn up about being separated from certain people for a while um, because a lot of my memory is traumatic. I experience a lot of flashbacks and trauma responses and everything together just created this like hurricane of despair. Um, and I was trying to adjust to the fact that it wasn't just me anymore and I don't know, it was just like really, really hard. My emotions were overwhelming and I acted on them a lot. Like, I don't know how many hospitalizations and attempts we've had, but it's a lot, so. Wow, that's a lot to handle. I am so sorry you had to go through that. So what about you, Jess? Yeah, so for me, it was a bit different. Uh, I'm technically a fictive alter, although I'm not really a huge fan of that term. It basically just means that my personality is based off of a fictional character, in my case, Jessica Jones. Um, I like to think of it more like I was just subconsciously inspired by her. I don't actually think I'm her, although I know that can be the case for some fictive and factive alters. And the reason that can happen is because DID ultimately is just a coping mechanism. Um, so say a stressful situation occurs and then the brain goes, oh, hey, this is a character I've seen who could help or if we were this character, we wouldn't be in pain or in this situation or, you know, whatever. Um, and so it's just looking for a solution to a problem. And then, you know, bam, walls off that part of consciousness who associates with that character and has the helpful traits of that character. And it's all just a coping mechanism. 
So, uh, yeah, when I first came to, uh, I had what I thought were memories from my past, but they weren't real memories. Um, I didn't know that at the time, though. So my first experience renting was more just like, huh, like <laughs> something's not right here. <laughs> um, and I had this like encoded <laughs> desire to just get outside and be active. So I went for a long walk. Um, actually, I went for a lot of long walks. What? Oh my god, I used to be so freaked out and confused because my pedometer would show that I had walked like four miles and my legs would hurt and I just had like no memory of it whatsoever. Yeah, bitch, that was me. Anyway, I remember Steven was the first one to approach me in the inner world and he basically explained what was going on and that we needed to help you because um, you were kind of a wreck. But anyway... I was just kind of made sure you ate, got outside, you know, normal life stuff. But yeah, bomb idea, by the way, Anna. We should just like make it a goal to blow Jen's mind every episode. <laughs> You're off to a good start. Uh, so when we're not fronting, we go to our inner world. It's like this kind of conceptualized world in our mind where we can all interact. But I mean, my memories from there feel just as real. And that's much different for me, being the host personality. Um, I don't really have access to the inner world. The only time I've, or times I've ever been there has been when I'm in like deep, deep meditation. Um, so for the most part, when I'm not fronting, either I experience total amnesia, just like time jumps, or it's very hazy, like trying to recall what happened in a dream. We should make our next video about switching now. I'm one step ahead of you. Oh, it's man. eternal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, that's all for today. We hope you enjoyed this first look into our lives. Um, be sure to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time.